Section 33 of the History of Greece. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Kirsten Ferreri. The History of Greece by J. B. Berry. Chapter 9 The Athenian Empire under Pericles. Section 3 Conclusion of Peace with Persia. The warfare of recent years had been an enormous strain on the resources of Athens, and it was found necessary to increase the burden of tribute imposed on her allies. She wanted a relief from the strain, but after the expedition of Pericles three or four years elapsed before peace was concluded. During that interval there seems to have been, by mutual consent of the combatants, a cessation from military operations. Lacedaemon and Argos first concluded a treaty of peace for thirty years, and then Seamen, who had returned to Athens, negotiated a truce which was fixed for five years between the Athenians and Peloponnesians. As soon as the peace was arranged, Athens and her allies were able to resume their warfare against Persia, and to no man could that warfare be more safely or fitly entrusted than to the hero of the Eurymedon River. Pericles may have been well pleased to use Simon's military experience, and an amicable arrangement seems to have been made, Simon undertaking not to interfere with the policy of Pericles. Gossip said that Simon's sister had much to do with bringing to pass the reconciliation. Quote, the charms, as well as the intrigues of Elpenes, appear to have figured conspicuously in the memoirs of Athenian biographers. They were employed by one party as a means of calumniating Simon by the other for discrediting Pericles. End quote. Women played no part in the history of Athena's city. The Phoenician fleet, which had put down the Egyptian rebellion, was afterwards sent to re-establish the authority of Artaxerxes in the island of Cyprus, and accordingly Simon sailed thither with a squadron of two hundred vessels. He detached sixty to help a princelet who had succeeded in defying the Persians in the fens of the delta of the Nile, for the Athenians, even after their calamity, had not entirely abandoned the thought of Egyptian conquest. Then he laid siege to Sitian. It was the last enterprise of the man who had conducted the war against Persia ever since the battle of Mycale. He died during the blockade and his death marks the beginning of a new period in which hostilities between Greek and Persian slumber. But one final success was gained. Raising the siege of Sitian because there was no food, the fleet arrived off Salamis, and the Greeks gained a double victory by sea and land over the Phoenician and Cilician ships. But this victory did not encourage the Athenians to continue the war. We have no glimpse of the counsels of their statement at this moment, but the facts of the situation enable us to understand their resolution to make peace with the great king. The events of recent years had proved to them that it was beyond the strength of Athens to carry on war at the same time in any effectual way, with the common enemy of all the Greeks, and with her rivals among the Greeks themselves. It was, therefore, necessary to choose between peace with Persia and peace in Greece. But an enduring peace in Greece could only be purchased by the surrender of those successes which Athens had lately gained. Corinth would never acquiesce until she had won back her old predominant position in her western gulf. So long as she was hemmed in, as Athens had hemmed her in, she would inevitably seize any favorable hour to strike for her release. Some Athenian politicians would have been ready to retreat from the positions which had been recently seized, and of which the occupation was most galling to Corinth. But Pericles, who had won these positions, was a strong imperialist. The aim of his statesmanship was to increase the Athenian Empire, and to spread the political influence of Athens within the borders of Greece. He was unwilling to let any part of her empire go, for the sake of earning new successes against the barbarian. The death of Simon, who had been the soul of the Persian War, may have helped Pericles to carry through his determination to bring that war to an end. And the great king on his side was disposed to negotiate, for the Greek victory of Cyprian Salamis had been followed by a revolt of Megabyzus, the general who had quelled the insurrection of Egypt. Accordingly, peace was made with Persia. There is a dark mist about the negotiations, so dark that it has been questioned whether a formal treaty was ever concluded. 
but there can be no reasonable doubt that Athens came to an understanding with Artaxerxes, and that peace ensued, and it is equally certain that there was a definite contract by which Persia undertook not to send ships of war into the Aegean, and Athens gave a similar pledge securing the coasts of the Persian Empire against attack. An embassy from Athens and her allies must have waited on the great king at Susa, and the terms of the arrangement must have been put in writing. But, on the other hand, there was no treaty as between two Greek states. The great king would never have consented to treat either with a Greek city or a federation of Greek cities as an equal, and he certainly did not stoop to the humiliation of formally acknowledging the independence of the Greek cities of Asia. It was enough that he should graciously promise to make certain concessions. But whatever were the diplomatic forms of the agreement, both parties meant peace, and peace was maintained. It has been called the Peace of Callias, and we have a record which makes it probable that the chief ambassador was Callias, the richest man at Athens, and the husband of Simon's sister. The first act in the strife of Greece and Persia thus closes. All the cities of Hellas which had come under barbarian sway had been reunited to the world of free Hellenic states, except in one outlying corner. The Greek cities of Cyprus were left to struggle with the Phoenicians as best they might, and the Phoenicians soon got the upper hand and held it for many years. They tried to extirpate Greek civilization from the island, but Greek civilization was a hardy growth, and we shall hereafter see Greek dynasties again in power. Section 4 Athenian Reverses The Thirty Years' Peace the peace with Persia, however, was not followed by further Athenian expansion within the defined limits. On the contrary, some of the most recent acquisitions of the Athenian Empire began to fall away. Orchomenus and Chaeronea and some other towns in western Boeotia were seized by exiled oligarchs, and it was necessary for Athens to intervene promptly. The general Tolmides went forth with a wholly inadequate number of troops. He took and garrisoned Chaeronea, but did not attempt Orchomenus. On his way home he was set upon by the exiles from Orchomenus, and some others, in the neighborhood of Chaeronea, and defeated. He was himself slain. Many of the hoplites were taken prisoners, and the Athenians, in order to obtain their release, resigned Boeotia. Thus the battle of Chaeronea undid the work of Enophyta. Athens had little reason to regret this loss, for dominion in Boeotia was not really conducive to the consolidation of her empire. To maintain control over the numerous city-states of the Boeotian country would have been a constant strain on her military resources, which would hardly have been remunerative. The loss of Boeotia was followed by the loss of Phocis and Locris. It was strange enough that Phocis should fall away. A few years before the Phocians had taken possession of Delphi— the Spartans had sent an army to rescue the shrine from their hands, and give it back to the Delphians, but as soon as the Spartans had gone, an Athenian army came, led by Pericles, and restored the sanctuary to the Phocians. It was a sacred war, but so conducted that it did not make a breach of the five years' truce. Yet although their position at Delphi seemed to depend on the support of Athens, the Phocians now deserted her alliance. The change was due to an oligarchical reaction in the Phocian cities, consequent on the oligarchical rising in Boeotia. The defeat of Chorinea dimmed the prestige of Athenian arms, and still more serious results ensued. Euboea and Megara revolted at the same moment. Here, too, oligarchical parties were at work. Pericles, who was a general, immediately went to Euboea with the regiments of seven of the tribes, while those of the remaining three marched into the Megarid but he had no sooner reached the island than he was overtaken by the news that the garrison in the city of Megara had been massacred, and that a Peloponnesian army was threatening Attica. He promptly returned, and his first object was to unite his forces with the troops in the Megarid, which were under the command of Andocides. But King Pleistoanax and the Lacedaemonians were between them commanding the east coast road. Andocides was compelled to return to Attica by creeping round the corner of the Corinthian Gulf at Agostheni and passing through Boeotia. The troops were guided by a man of Megara named Pythian, and the gratitude of the three tribes, quote, whom he saved by leading them from Pagae through Boeotia to Athens, was recorded on his funeral monument. The stone has survived, and the verses written upon it are a touching reminiscence of a moment of great peril. But when the whole army united in Attica, the peril was past. 
the return of Pericles had disconcerted King Pleistoanax, who commanded the Lacedaemonians, and having advanced only as far as the Thriasian plain he withdrew, deeming it useless to strike at Athens. Pericles was thus set free to carry out the reduction of Euboea. Histea, the city in the north of the island, was most hardly dealt with, probably because her resistance was most obstinate. The people were driven out, their territory annexed to Athens, and the new settlement of Oreos took the place of Histea. In other cases the position of each state was settled by an agreement, and the arrangements which were made with Calchas were still preserved in stone. The alarm of the Athenians is reflected in reductions of tribute which they allowed to their subject states. They feared that the example of Euboea might spread. The truce of five years was now approaching its end, and peace was felt to be so indispensable that they resigned themselves to purchasing a more durable treaty by considerable concessions. They had lost Megara, but they still held the two ports Nicaea and Page. Thessy, as well as Achaea, they agreed to surrender, and on this basis a peace was concluded for thirty years between the Athenians and the Peloponnesians. All the allies of both sides were enumerated in the treaty, and it was stipulated that neither Athens nor Lacedaemon was to admit into her alliance an ally of the other, while neutral states might join whichever alliance they chose. It was a humiliating peace for Athens, and perhaps would not have been concluded but for the alarm which had been caused by the inroad of the Peloponnesians into Attic territory. While the loss of Boeotia was probably a gain, and the evacuation of Achaea might be lightly endured, the loss of the Megarid was a serious blow. For while Athens held the long walls and the passes of Geronea, she had complete immunity from Peloponnesian invasions of her soil. Henceforth, Attica was always exposed to such aggressions. Besides this, her position in the Crissaean Gulf was greatly weakened. The attempt which she had made to win a land empire had succeeded only for a brief space. The lesson was that she must devote her whole energy to maintaining her maritime dominion. It was a gloomy moment for the Athenians, and it must have required all the tact and eloquence of Pericles to restore the shaken confidence and revive the drooping spirits. Euboea, at all events, was safe, and men might look back over sixty years to that victory which had been won by their ancestors, in a critical hour, over a joint attack of the Boeotians and Chalcidians. On that occasion a tithe of the spoil had been dedicated to Athena. Pericles now set up a bronze chariot with this tithe, and so associated the earlier victory with his own. The parallel was close, for the rebellion of Euboea had mainly been instigated by the Boeotian oligarchs, who freed their own land from Athenian control. The marble base on which the chariot stood, on the Acropolis, has been found, and a few letters of the inscribed verses which Herodotus read and copied can be made out. The recollection that the sons of the Athenians quenched the insolence of the Boeotians, as these verses have it, was indeed the only consolation that could be offered for the defeat of Coronea. While he made the most of the reduction of Euboea, Pericles may also have dwelt on the prospects of the Attic Sea Empire. He may have elated them by words such as he is reported to have used at a later moment of despondency, quote, Of the two divisions of the world accessible to man, the land and the sea, there is one of which you are absolute masters, and have or may have the dominion to any extent you please. Neither the great king nor any nation on earth can hinder a navy like yours from penetrating whithersoever you choose to sail. End quote. Thucydides, Book Two, Chapter Sixty Two. Section five. The Imperialism of Pericles and the Opposition to His Policy. The cities of the Athenian alliance might have claimed, when the Persian war was ended, that the confederacy should be broken up, and that they should resume their original and rightful freedom. The fair answer to this claim would have been that peace had indeed come, but that it would endure only so long as a power was maintained strong enough to stand up against the might of Persia. Dissolve the confederacy, and the cities will severally and speedily become the prey of the barbarian. But in any case, the confederacy had become an empire, and Athens was in the full career of an ambitious imperialist state. The tributes which she imposed on her subjects were probably not oppressive, and were constantly revised. When the five years' truce was about to be concluded, she reduced the tribute which had been increased under the stress of war to its former amount. She did not force her own coinage upon her subjects. Every city might have its own mint, and most of them had. But there was much that was galling in her empire, to communities in which the love of freedom was strongly developed. The revolt and reduction of Euboea showed in its undisguised shape the rule of might. 
It must, however, be remembered, in judging of the feelings of the cities toward their mistress, that in nearly every city there were an oligarchical and a democratical party. The democracy was supported by Athens, and was generally friendly to her. The oligarchs were always on the watch for an opportunity to rebel. And for this reason a revolt is not in itself evidence that Athens was unpopular among her allies. The Carian and Lycian cities began to fall away after the peace with Persia, but most of them were only superficially Hellenized, and Athens let them go, not thinking it worth while to take measures for retaining her control of them. Pericles had been the guide of the Athenian people in the recent war. His counsels had directed their imperial policy. But that policy had not been unchallenged. His leadership had not been unopposed. There was a strong oligarchical party at Athens which not only disliked the democracy of her city, but arraigned their empire. Most of this party attacked the imperialist policy of Pericles purely from party motives, and for the purpose of attacking him, but there was one man at least who may claim the credit of having honestly espoused the cause of the allied cities against the unscrupulous selfishness of his own city. This was Thucydides, the son of Milesius, a man who had connections with many of the allies. He maintained that the tribute should be reserved exclusively for the purpose for which it was levied, the defense of Greece against Persia, and that Athens had no right to spend it on other things, especially things which concerned herself alone and did not benefit the cities. It was an injustice that these cities should have to defray any part of the costs of an Athenian campaign in Boeotia or a new temple in Athens. This was a just view. But justice is never entirely compatible with the growth of a country to political greatness, and Pericles was resolved to make his country great at all hazards. For this purpose, his policy toward the allied cities was, in a phrase which seems to have been his own, to keep them well in hand. It is pleasant to find that voices were raised against his unscrupulous imperialism. The more extreme section of the party which supported Thucydides would not have hesitated to betray Athens into the hands of her foes for the sake of overthrowing the democracy. They had tried to do this at the time of the Battle of Tanagra. Much less would they have scrupled to give secret help to the oligarchical parties which worked against Athenian rule in the subject cities. Oligarchy had raised its head in many places during the five years' truce. Oligarchical movements had led to the loss of Boeotia. Oligarchical movements had caused the revolts of Megara and Eubea. Oligarchy had even prevailed in Phocis. There can be little doubt that this widespread oligarchical activity had its echo in Athens, and that these years the party opposed to Pericles was loud and aggressive. He met that opposition with remarkable dexterity. He introduced a new policy, which, while it was thoroughly imperialist, was so popular at Athens that his adversaries were silenced. Among the measures which Pericles initiated to strengthen the empire of his city, none was more important in its results than the system of settling Athenian citizens abroad. Like measures of many great statesmen, this policy affected the solution of two diverse problems. The colonies which were thus sent to different parts of the empire served as garrisons in the lands of subject allies, and they also helped to provide for part of the superfluous population of Athens. The first of these Periclean clerishes was established in the Thracian Chersonese, under the personal supervision of Pericles himself. Lands were bought from the allied cities of the peninsula, and a thousand Athenian citizens, chiefly of the poor and unemployed, were allotted farms, and assigned to the several cities. The payment for the land was made in the shape of a reduction of the tribute. At the same time Pericles restored the wall which Miltiades had built across the isthmus to protect the city against the Thracians. In view of the rising power of the Thracian prince Terrace, this precaution was wise. The outsettlements in the Chersonese, which were probably followed by outsettlements in Lemnos and Imbros, the island warders of the gate of the Propontis, were the most important of all. The same policy was at the same time adopted in Euboea and some of the islands of the Aegean, and in a mysterious place, the Thracian Brea, which probably lay west of the Strymon. The original act of the colonization of Brea has been preserved, and the provision that all the settlers shall belong to the two poorest classes of the people on the Salonian classification illustrates the character of the Periclean clerishes. The policy was naturally popular at Athens, since it provided for thousands of unemployed who cumbered the streets, and perhaps it may be regarded as one of the happiest strokes devised by Pericles for increasing his ascendancy and confounding his opponents. 
but it was a policy which was highly unpopular among the allies, in whose territories the settlements were made, and it gave perhaps more dissatisfaction than any other feature of Athenian rule. Most Athenian citizens were naturally allured by a policy of expansion which made their city great and powerful without exacting heavy sacrifices from themselves. The day had not yet come when they were unwilling to undertake military service, and they were content as long as the cost of maintaining the empire did not tax their purses. The empire furthered the extension of their trade and increased their prosperity. The average Athenian burgher was not hindered by his own full measure of freedom from being willing to press, with as little scruple as any tyrant, the yoke of his city upon the necks of other communities. So long as the profits of empire were many and its burdens light, the Athenian democracy would feel few searchings of heart in adopting the imperialism of Pericles. That imperialism was indeed of a lofty kind. The aim of the statesmen who guided the destinies of Athens in these days of her greatness was to make her the queen of Hellas, to spread her sway on the mainland as well as beyond the seas, and to make her political influence felt in those states which it would have been unwise, and perhaps impossible, to draw within the borders of her empire. The full achievement of this ideal would have meant the union of all the Greeks, a union held together by the power of Athens, but having a natural support in a common religion, common traditions, common customs, and a common language. Shortly before the loss of Boeotia through the defeat of Coronea, Athens addressed to Greece an open declaration of her Panhellenic ambition. She invited the Greek states to send representatives to an Hellenic Congress at Athens, for the purpose of discussing certain matters of common interest, to restore the temples which had been burned by the Persians, to pay the votive offerings which were due to the gods for the great deliverance, and to take common measures for clearing the seas of piracy. This was the program which Athens proposed to the consideration of Greece. The invitation did not go to the West, for the Italiates and Siceliots were not directly concerned in the Persian War, but it went to all the cities of old Greece, and to the cities and islands which belonged to the Athenian Empire. If the Congress had taken place, it would have inaugurated an amphictyony of all Hellas, and Athens would have been the centre of this vast religious union. It was a sublime project, but it could not be. It was not to be expected that Sparta would fall in with a project which, however noble and pious it sounded, might tempt or help Athens to strike out new and perilous paths of ambition and aggrandizement. The Athenian envoys were rebuffed in the Peloponnesus, and the plan fell through. Immediately after this, the revolution in Boeotia deprived Athens of her empire on the mainland. End of section 33《ラプラトンの歴史を知ることは、あなたの歴史を知ることは、あなたの歴史を知ることは、あなたの歴史を知ることは、あなたの歴史を知ることは、あなたの歴史を知ることは、あなたの歴史を知ることは、あなたの歴史を知ることは、あなたの歴史を知ることは、あなたの歴史を知ることは、あなたの歴史を知ることは、あなたの歴史を知ることは、あなたの歴史The Restoration of the Temples. It remained then for Athens to carry out that part of the program which concerned herself, and restore in greater splendor the temples of her city and her land. We shall miss the meaning of the architectural monuments which now begin to rise under the direction and influence of Pericles if we do not clearly grasp their historical motive and recognize their immediate connection with the Persian War. It devolved upon the city as a religious duty to make good the injuries which the barbarian had inflicted upon the habitations of her gods, and fully to pay her debt of gratitude to heaven for the defeat of the Mede. And seeing that Athens had won her great empire through that defeat, the gods might well expect that she would perform this duty on no small scale and in no niggardly spirit. In this, above all, was the greatness of Pericles displayed, that he discerned the importance of performing it on a grand scale. He recognized that the city, by ennobling the houses of her gods, would ennoble herself, and that she could express her own might and her ideals in no worthier way than by the erection of beautiful temples. His architectural plans went farther than this. 
and we can see that he was influenced by the example of the Pisistratids. But the chief buildings of the Periclean age, it should always be remembered, were, like the Athenian Empire itself, the direct consequence of the Persian invasion. Of the monuments which, in the course of twenty years, changed the appearance of the Acropolis, one of the first was a gigantic statue of Athena, wrought in bronze. The goddess stood near the west brow of her own hill, looking southwestward, and her helmet and the tip of her lance flashing in the sun could be seen far off at sea. But nothing was so pressing as to carry to completion the new house of the goddess, which had been begun in the days of Themistocles and never finished. The work was now resumed on the same site, and the same foundations, but it was resumed on an entirely different plan, which was drawn up by the gifted architect Ictinus. The new temple was slightly broader, but considerably shorter than it would have been if the old design had been carried out, and instead of foreign Parian marble, native Attic from the quarries of Pentelicus was employed. Callicrates, another expert architect, superintended the execution of the plan which Ictinus had conceived. It is not within our province to enter here into the architectural beauties of this perfect Dorian temple, which came afterwards to be generally known as the Parthenon. The building contained two rooms, between which there was no communication. The eastern room, into which one entered from the Pronaos, was the temple proper, and contained the statue of the goddess. It was about a hundred feet long, and was hence officially called the Hecatompedos. The door of the small western room was on the west side of the temple. This chamber was perhaps designed for the habitation of invisible maidens who attended the maiden goddess. It is at least certain that it was called the Parthenon. It is easy to imagine how a word which designated as the room of the maidens part of the house of the maiden could soon come to be associated popularly with the whole building, and the name Parthenon came to mean for the ordinary ear, in defiance of official usage, the temple of Athena Parthenos, and not the chamber of her virgins. The goddess stood in her dwelling, majestic and smiling, her colossal figure arrayed in a golden robe, a helmet on her head, her right hand holding a golden victory, and her left resting on her shield, while the snake Erichthonius was coiled at her feet. It was a wooden statue covered with ivory and gold, ivory for the exposed flesh, gold for the raiment, and hence called chryselephantine. It was wrought by the Athenian sculptor of genius, who has given his name to the plastic art of the Periclean age, Phidias, the son of Charmides. He had already made his fame by another beautiful statue of the goddess of the city, which the outsettlers who went forth to colonize Lemnos dedicated on the Acropolis. The Lemnian Athena was wrought in bronze, and it revealed Athena to her people in the guise of their friend, while the image of the Parthenon showed her rather as their queen. Both these creations have perished but copies have been preserved from which we can frame some far-off idea of the sculptor's work. To Phidias, too, was entrusted the task of designing and carrying out those plastic decorations which were necessary to the completion of a great temple. With the metopes of the lofty entablature from which centaurs and giants stood out in high relief, the great master had probably little to do but in the two pediments and on the frieze which ran around the wall of the temple within the colonnade he left monuments of his genius and his skill for mankind to adore the triangle above the eastern portal was adorned with the scene of the birth of athena who had sprung from the head of zeus at the rising of the sun and the setting of the moon and iris the heavenly messenger was shown going forth to carry the good news to the ends of the world. 
The pediment of the western end was occupied with the passage in the life of the goddess that specially appertained to Attica. Her triumph on the Acropolis in her contest with her rival Poseidon for the lordship of the land. The olive which came forth from the earth by her enchantment was probably shown, and we should like to believe that at the northern and southern ends reclined the two river gods, Eridanus and Ilissus, each at the side which was nearest his own waters. The subject of the wonderful frieze which encircled the temple from end to end was the most solemn of all the ceremonies which the Athenians performed in honour of their queen. At the great Panathenaic festival every fourth year, they went up in long procession to her temple to present her with a new robe. The advance of this procession, starting from the western side and moving simultaneously along the northern and southern sides to meet at the eastern entrance, was vividly shown on the frieze of the Parthenon. Walking along the peristyle and looking upwards, the spectator saw the Athenian knights, beautiful young men on horseback, charioteers, citizens on foot, musicians, kine, and sheep led for sacrifice stately maidens with sacred vessels, the nine archons of the city, all advancing to the house of Athena where she entertains the celestials on her feast day. The high gods are seated on thrones, Zeus on one side of Athena, Hephaestus on the other, and near the goddess is a peplos, perhaps the old peplos, in the hands of a priest. The western side of the frieze is still in its place, but the rest has been removed, the greater part to our own island. Athena Polias had now two houses side by side on her hill, for the old restored temple was not destroyed, nor was her old image removed from it. But in her character of victory, yet another small habitation was built for her by the architect Callicrates. About the same time, on the bastion which the hill throws out on its southwestern side. Footnote. An inscription of circa 450 B.C. providing for the building of the temple and the altar has been recently discovered. End footnote. It was an appropriate spot for the House of Victory. The Athenians standing on that platform saw Salamis and Aegina near him, his eye ranged along the Argolic coast to the distant citadel of Corinth and the mountains of the Megarid. Under the shadow of victory he could lose himself in reveries of memory and dreams of hope. The motive of the temple, as a memorial of the Persian War, was written clear in the frieze. Whereas the sculptures of other temples of this period only alluded indirectly to that great struggle, by the representation of mythical wars, such as the war of Greek and Amazons, or of Lapiths and Centaurs, or of gods and giants. On the frieze of Athena Nike, a battle between the Greeks and Persians is portrayed. It is the battle of Plataea, for Greeks are shown fighting in the Persian host. But there were other shrines of other gods in Athens and Attica, which had been wrecked by the Persians, and which were now to be restored. From the west side of the Acropolis, as one looks down on the western quarter of the city, no building is so prominent, or can ever have been so prominent, as the Dorian temple of Pentelic marble, which crowns the hill of Colonus, and replaced an older temple of the limestone of Piraeus. It is the temple which the sons of Hephaestus built for their sire, the god of handicraftsmen, who was always worshipped with special devotion at Athens. It is significant that on the frieze of the Parthenon he sits next to the Lady of the Land. This house of Hephaestus is the only Greek temple that is not a ruin. About the same time a marble temple of Poseidon rose on the extreme point of southern Attica, the promontory of Sunium. The Persian invasion had probably been fatal to the old temple of porous stone. Here the sea-god, to whom men pray at Sunium, seems to have had his own house, 
looking down upon his own domain. He was not forced here, as on the Acropolis, to share a sanctuary with Athena, but the goddess had a separate temple of her own hard by. At the other extremity of the Attic land, the shrine of the goddesses of Eleusis had likewise been destroyed by the barbarians. The rebuilding had been soon begun, but like the new temple of Athena on the Acropolis, the work had been discontinued owing to the claims of war on the revenue of the state. Under Pericles it was taken up again and completed. Ictinus made the design, and Corybus carried it out. The new hall of mysteries was built of the dark stone of Eleusis. One side of it was formed by the rock of the hill under which it was built, and the stone steps around the walls would have seated about three thousand. As the place was close to the Megarian frontier, a strong wall with towers was erected round the precincts of the shrine, so that the place had the aspect of a fortress. These splendid buildings required a large outlay of money, and thus gave the political opponents of Pericles a welcome handle against him. Thucydides was the leader of the outcry. He accused Pericles not merely of squandering the resources of the state, which ought to be kept as a reserve for war, but of misappropriating the money of the Confederacy for purely Athenian purposes. Athens, it was said, was like a vain woman, adorning herself with pendants of precious stones and statues and temples that cost a thousand talents. It is certainly true that some money was taken from the treasury of the Hellenotemii for the new buildings, but this was only a very small part of the cost, which was mainly defrayed by the treasury of Athena and by the public treasury of Athens. There was, however, a good case against Pericles both on grounds of policy and on grounds of justice. The plea for taking a part of the tribute, perhaps a sixtieth, besides the sixtieth which was consecrated to Athena, Doubtless was that the restoration of Greek temples, destroyed by the Persians, was a duty which devolved upon all the Greeks. But Pericles, with bold sophistry, argued that the allies had no reason to complain, so long as Athens defended them efficiently. This was the contract, and they had no right to interfere in her disposition of the funds. Three years after the Thirty Years' Peace, Thucydides thought that he could bring the question to an issue, and he asked the people to agitate by the sherd. But the people voted for the ostracism of Thucydides, and henceforward Pericles had no opponent of influence to thwart his policy or cross his way. The buildings already begun could now be continued without criticism, and new works could be undertaken. A great hall of music, or Odeon, intended for the musical contests which had recently been added to the Panathenaic celebrations, was now erected on the east side of the theatre of Dionysus. Its roof, made of the masts and yard-arms of captured Persian ships, was pointed like a tent, and wits compared it to the helmet of Pericles the Strategos. The trial by Sherd is over, says someone in a play which the comet poet Cratinus put on the stage at this time. So here comes Pericles, our peak-headed Zeus, with the Odeon set on his crown. Though Simon, when he constructed the southern wall of the Acropolis, also built a new entrance gate facing southwestward, it was too small and unimposing to relieve the frowning aspect of the walled hill. A more worthy approach, worthy of the Parthenon, was devised by the architect Meniscles and met the approbation of Pericles. The buildings designed by Meniscles occupied the whole west side of the hill. In the center, on the brow of the height and facing westward, was to be the entrance with five gates, and on either side of this two vast columned halls, reaching to the north and south brinks of the hill, in which the Athenians could walk sheltered from sun and rain. Thrown out on the projecting cliffs in front of these halls were to be two spacious wings, 
flanking the ascent to the central gate. But the plan of Meniscles took no account of the sanctuaries on the southwestern part of the Acropolis, on which his new buildings would encroach. The southern colonnade would have cut short the precinct of Artemis Broeronia, and the adjacent southern wing would have infringed on the enclosure of Athena Nike. On the north side there were no such impediments. The priests of these goddesses raised objections to the execution of the architect's plan at the expense of their sacred precincts, and in consequence the grand idea of Meniscles was only partly carried out. But even after the building had begun, Pericles and his architect never abandoned the hope that the scruples of the priests might ultimately be overcome. And while they omitted altogether the southern colonnade, and reduced the proportions of the southern wing, they built in such a way that at some future time the structure might be easily enlarged to the measures of the original design. On the northern side, too, the idea of Meniscles was not completed, but for a different reason. The covered colonnade was never built. It was left to the last, and when the time came, Athens was threatened by a great war, and deemed it unwise to undertake any further outlay on building. But the northwestern wing was built and was adorned with painting. The greatest paintings that Athens possessed were, however, not on the hill, but in buildings below, and they belonged to a somewhat earlier age. It was Simon who brought Polygnotus of Thassos to Athens, and it was when Simon was in power that he, in collaboration with Mycon, another eminent painter, decorated with life-size frescoes the new Thasium and the Anaceum on the north side of the Acropolis, and the walls of the painted portico in the marketplace. We have already cast a glance at the picture of the Battle of Marathon. The most famous of the pictures of the Thasian master was executed after he had left Athens, for the speech hall of the Snidians at Delphi. Its subject was the underworld, visited by Odysseus. If it was vain for Athens to hope that Greece would yield her any formal acknowledgment of headship, she might at all events have the triumph of exerting intellectual influence even in the lands which were least ready to admit her claims. And in the field of art she partly fulfilled the ambition of Pericles, who, when he could not make her the queen, desired that she should be the instructress of Hellas. When Phidias had completed the great statue of Athena in gold and ivory, and had seen it set up in the new temple, he went forth, invited by the men of Elis, to make the image for the temple of Zeus at Olympia. For five years in his workshop in the Altus, the Athenian sculptor wrought at the great Chryselephantine god, and the colossal image which came from his hands was probably the highest creation ever achieved by the plastic art of Greece. The Panhellenic god, seated on a lofty throne and clad in a golden robe, held a victory in his right hand and a scepter in his left. He was bearded, and his hair was wreathed with a branch of olive. Many have borne witness to the impression which the serene aspect of this manifest divinity always produced upon the heart of the beholder. Let a man, sick and weary in his soul, who has passed through many distresses and sorrows, whose pillow is unvisited by kindly sleep, stand in front of this image, he will, I deem, forget all the terrors and troubles of human life. An Athenian had wrought, for one of the two great centers of Hellenic religion, the most sublime expression of the Greek ideal of Godhead. Nor was Phidias the only Athenian artist who worked abroad. We also find the architect Ictinus engaged in designing temples in the Peloponnesus. Section 7. The Piraeus. Growth of Athenian Trade. The Piraeus had grown enormously since it had been fortified by Themistocles. It was now one of the great ports and cheaping towns in the midst of Hellas, and Pericles took in hand to make it a greater and fairer place. There was one weak point in the common defenses of Piraeus and Athens. 
between Munichia and the extreme end of the southern wall, which ran down to the strand of Phaleron, there was an unfortified piece of marshy shore, where an enemy might land at night. This defect might have been remedied by building a cross-wall, but a wholly different plan was adopted. A new long wall was built, running parallel and close to the northern wall, and like it, joining the fortification of Piraeus with the upper city, as Athens was locally called. The southern or Phaleron wall consequently ceased to be part of the system of defence and was allowed to fall into disrepair. Round the three harbours shipsteads were constructed, in which the vessels could lie high and dry, and on the wharfs and quays new storehouses and buildings of sundry kinds arose for the convenience of shipping and trade. On the east side of the great harbour the chief traffic was carried on in the place of commerce. This mart was marked off by boundary stones, some of which are still preserved, and was subject to the control of a special board of officers. The most famous of the buildings in the place of commerce was the colonnade known as the Daigma or show-place, where merchants showed their wares. But Pericles was not content with the erection of new buildings. The whole town, which crept up the slopes of Munichia from the quays of the great harbour, was laid out on a completely new system, which created considerable interest in Greece. It was the rectangular system, on which the main streets run parallel and are cut by cross streets at right angles. The Piraeus was the first town in Europe where this plan was adopted, which we now see carried out on a large scale in many modern cities. The idea was due to Hippodamus, an architect of Miletus, a man of a speculative as well as practical turn, who tried with less success to apply his principles of symmetry to politics, and sketched the scheme of a model state whose institutions were as precisely correlated as the streets of his model town. The increase of Athenian trade was largely due to the decline of the merchant cities of Ionia, as well as to the blow which was struck to the Phoenician commerce by the victory of Greece over Persia. The decay of Ionian commerce is strikingly reflected in the tribute records of the Athenian confederacy, where the small sums paid by the Ionians are contrasted with the large tributes of the cities on the shores of the Propontis. Lampsacus contributes twice as much as Ephesus. Both trade and industry migrated from the eastern to western and northern shores of the Aegean, and this charge coincided with the rise of her empire. It was Athens that it chiefly profited. The population of Athens and her harbour multiplied, and about this time the whole number of the inhabitants of Attica seemed to have been about 250,000, perhaps more than twice as large as the population of the Corinthian state. But nearly half of these inhabitants were slaves, for one consequence of the growth of manufacturers was the inflowing of slave hands into the manufacturing towns. In towns where the people subsisted on the fruits of agriculture, the demand for slaves remained small. It should be observed that although Greece, and especially Athens, consumed large quantities of corn brought from beyond the seas, this did not ruin the agriculture of Greece. The costs of transport were so great that home-grown corn could still be profitable. Except in remote or unusually conservative regions, money had now entirely displaced more primitive standards of exchange and valuation. Most Greek states of any size issued their own coins, and their money at this time was in almost all cases silver. Silver had become plentiful, and prices had necessarily gone up. Thus the price of barley and wheat had become two or three times dearer than a hundred years before. Far more remarkable was the increase in the price of stock. In the days of Solon a sheep could be bought for a drachma, 
in the days of Pericles, its cost might approach fifty drachmae. As money was cheap, interest should have been low, but mercantile enterprise was so active, the demand for capital so great, and security so inadequate, that the usual price of a loan was twelve per cent. End of chapter 9, part 7 Recording by Kalinda in Raymond, New Hampshire on February 6, 2008Chapter 9, Part 8 of A History of Greece to the Death of Alexander the Great, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kalinda. A History of Greece to the Death of Alexander the Great, Volume 1, by John Bagnall Bury. Chapter 9. Part Eight. Athenian Enterprise in Italy In the far west, Athens was spreading her influence and pushing her trade. She supplied Etruria with her black red-figured pottery, and there was a market for these products of her industry, even in the remote valley of the Po. Her ships brought back metalworks from Tuscany, carpets and cushions from Carthage, corn, cheese, and pork from Sicily. The Greek cities of Sicily had gradually adopted the Attic standard for their currency, and in the little Italian republic on the Tiber, which was afterwards destined to make laws for the whole world, the fame of the legislation of Solon was so high that envoys were sent to Athens to obtain a copy of the code. Thus Athens had stepped into the place of Chalcis. She was now the chief Ionian trader with Italian and Sicilian lands. Her rival in this western commerce was Corinth, but she was beginning to outdistance the great Dorian merchant city. In this competition Athens had one advantage. By the possession of Naupactus she could control the entrance to the Corinthian Gulf, a perpetual menace to Corinth, while the hatred which existed between Corinth and her colony Corsera prevented this island from being used as useful as it should have been to the Corinthian traffic with the west. On the other hand, Corinth had the advantage of having important colonies in the west, with which she maintained intimate relations, especially Syracuse, and these maritime cities were centers of her trade and influence. Next to Athens herself, Syracuse was probably the largest and most populous city in the Greek world. Athens had no colonies and no such centers. The disadvantage was felt by Themistocles and his active brain devised the occupation of the site of Cirrus, which had been destroyed by its neighbors, but the scheme was not realized. At length the opportunity came when Pericles was at the head of affairs. Here, as in other cases, it fell upon him to execute ideas of Themistocles. The men of old Sybaris, who since the destruction of their own town had dwelled in neighboring cities, thought that they might at length return to build a new Sybaris on the old site. But within five years their old foes, the men of Croton, went up and drove them out. Yet they did not despair, but hoped to compass with the help of others what they had failed to accomplish by themselves. They invited Athens and Sparta to take part in founding a new city. For Sparta the offer had no attraction, but for Athens it was a welcome opportunity— the land of Sybaris was famous for its fertility, and the position was suitable for Athenian commerce. But Pericles determined to give the enterprise an international significance. It was to be more than a mere Athenian speculation. It was proclaimed throughout the Peloponnesus that whosoever wished might take part in the foundation of the new colony. The Peloponnesus, and especially Achaea, with whose cities Athens had been closely connected in recent years, was the mother country of the Greek colonies which fringed the Tarentine Gulf, and the idea of Pericles was that the mother country, under the auspices of Athens, should establish the new city. Achaea, Arcadia, and Elis responded to the call. New Sybaris was founded, 
and the Athenian predominance was expressed in the image of Athena with Attic helmet on the coins of the young city. But the men of old Sybaris were not content to stand on an equal footing with the colonists who had come to help them from the mother country. They thought that their old connection to the place entitled them to a privileged position. They claimed an exclusive right to the most important offices in the state. Such claims could not be tolerated. A battle was fought, and the Sybarites were driven out. But, when the city was thus deplenished, there was a pressing need for men, and for the second time an appeal was made to Athens, but this time from her own children. To the second appeal Athens, under the guidance of Pericles, responded by an enterprise on a still greater scale. All Greece was now invited to take part in founding a pan-Hellenic colony. In carrying out this project, the right-hand man of Pericles was the seer and interpreter, exegete, Lampon, who was closely connected with the Eleusinian worship, and was the highest authority in Athens on all matters pertaining to religion. He obtained from the Delphic god an oracle touching the new colony. It was to be planted where men could drink water by measure and eat bread without measure. At Athens the enemies of Pericles opposed the project, and especially the pan-Hellenic character which he sought to impress upon it. Cratinus brought out a play deriding Lampon, and asking whether Pericles was a second Theseus, who wanted to cynicize the whole of Greece. But Greece responded to the Athenian proposal, and the colony went forth under the guidance of Lampon. Not far from the site of Sybaris they found a stream gushing from a bronze pipe, which was locally known as the bushel. Here clearly was the measured water to which the oracle pointed, while the land was so fruitful that it might well be said to furnish bread without measure. The place was named Thuri, and the new city was designed by Hippodamus, the architect who had laid out the Piraeus in rectangular streets. The constitution of Thuri was naturally a democracy, but though the influence of the Athenian model might be recognized, the colony adopted not the laws of Solon, but those of Zeleucus, the lawgiver of Locri. Some years after the foundation the question was asked, who was the founder? and the Delphic god himself claimed the honor. The coins of Thuri were stamped with Athena's head and an olive branch, and the place became, as it was intended, a center of Athenian influence in Italy, although the Attic element in the population failed to maintain its predominance. Section 9. Athenian Policy in Thrace and the Euxine But Athens had greater and more immediate interests in the eastern sea, where she succeeded Miletus, than in the western, where she succeeded Chalcis. The importance of the imports from the Pontus, especially corn, fish, and wood, was more vital than that of the wares which came to her from the west. And hence there was nothing of higher consequence in the eyes of a clear-sighted statesman than the assurance of the line of communication between Athens and the Euxine Sea and the occupation of strong and favorable points on the coast of the Euxine itself. The outer gate of the Euxine was secured by the possession of the Chersonese, which Pericles strengthened, and the inner gate by the control of Byzantium and Chalcedon, members of the Athenian confederacy. In the Euxine, Athens relied on the Greek towns which, fringing the shores at distant intervals, looked to her for support against the neighboring barbarians. The corn market in the Athenian agora was sensitive to every political movement in Thrace and Scythia, and it was necessary to be ever ready to support the ships of trade by the presence of ships of war. The growth of a large Thracian kingdom under Teres and his son Sidalces demanded the attention of Athenian statesmen to these regions more pressingly than ever. The power of Teres reached to the Danube, and his influence to Dnieper but he married his daughter to the king of the neighboring Scythians. It was in order to impress the barbarians of the Euxine regions with a just sense of the greatness of the Athenian sea-power that Pericles sailed himself to the Pontus, in command of an imposing squadron. Of that voyage we know little. It is ascertained that he visited Sinope, and that in consequence of his visit the Athenians gained a permanent footing at that important point. 
it is probable that he also sailed to the Sumerian Bosphorus, and visited the Archaeanacted lords of Penticopeum, who were distinguished for many a long year by their abiding friendship to Athens in her good and evil days alike. At Penticopeum was the centre of the Euxine corn trade. This intimacy was of the highest importance. The union of the Thracian tribes under a powerful king constrained Athens also to keep a watchful eye upon the north coast of the Aegean and the eastern front of Macedonia. The most important point on that coast, both from a commercial and strategic point of view, was the mouth of the Strymon, where the Athenians possessed the fortress of Ion. Not far from the mouth was the bridge over which all the trade between Thrace and Macedonia passed to and fro, and up the Strymon valley ran the chief roads into the hinterland. The mountains of the neighborhood were famous for the veins of gold and silver stored in their recesses. The Macedonian king Alexander had tapped a mine near Lake Prasius, which yielded daily a silver talent. In the days of Simon, Athens had attempted to strengthen Aeon by establishing a colony at the Nine Ways by the Strymon Bridge. We saw how that attempt roused the opposition of Thassos, whose interest it menaced and though Thassos was subdued, the colony of the Nine Ways was destroyed by the neighboring barbarians. Thirty years later, Pericles resumed the project with greater success. Hagnon, son of Nicias, led forth a colony of Athenians and others, and founded a new city, surrounded on three sides by the Strymon stream, and called its name Amphipolis. It flourished and became, as was inevitable, the most important place on the coast but a local feeling grew up unfavorable to the mother country, and the city was lost to Athens within fifteen years of its foundation, as we shall see hereafter. Section 10. The Revolt of Samos After the ostracism of Thucydides, Pericles reigned, the undisputed leader of Athenian policy, for nearly fifteen years. He ruled as absolutely as a tyrant, and folk might have said that his rule was a continuation of the tyranny of the Pisistratids. But his position was entirely constitutional, and it had the stablest foundation, his moral influence, over the sovereign people. He had the power of persuading them to do whatever he thought good, and every year for fifteen years after his rival's banishment he was elected one of the generals. Although all the ten generals nominally possessed equal powers— Yet the man who possessed the supreme political influence and enjoyed the confidence of the people was practically chief of the ten, and had the conduct of foreign affairs in his hands. Pericles was not irresponsible, for at the end of any official year the people could decline to re-elect him and could call him to account for his acts. When he had once gained the undisputed mastery, the only forces which he used to maintain it were wisdom and eloquence. Whatever devices he may have employed in his earlier career for party purposes, he rejected now all vulgar means of courting popularity or catching votes. He believed in himself, and he sought to raise the people to his own wisdom. He would not stoop to their folly. The desire of autocratic authority was doubtless part of his nature, but his spirit was fine enough to feel that it was a greater thing to be a leader of free men, whom he must convince by speech, than despot of subjects who must obey his nod. Yet this leader of democracy was disdainful of the vulgar herd, and perhaps no one knew more exactly than he the weak points in a democratic constitution. There is no better equipment for the highest statesmanship than the temper which holds aloof from the public and shows a front of good-natured indifference towards unfriendly criticism. And we may be sure that this quality in the temperament of Pericles helped to establish his success and maintain his supremacy. Pericles was a man of finer fiber than Themistocles, but he was not, like Themistocles, a statesman of originative genius. He originated little. He elaborated the ideas of others. He brought to perfection the sovereignty of the people, which had been fully established in principle long ago. He raised to its height the empire, which had already been founded. As an orator, he may have had true genius. Of that we cannot judge. 
it was his privilege to guide the policy of his country at a time when she had poets and artists who stand alone and eminent not only in her own annals and those of greece but in the history of mankind the periclean age the age of sophocles and euripides ictinus and phidias was not made by pericles but pericles though not creative was one of its most interesting figures perhaps his best service to greece was one which is often overlooked the preservation of peace for twelve years between athens and her jealous continental neighbors an achievement which demanded statesmanship of no ordinary tact in his military operations he seems to have been competent though we have not material to criticize them minutely he was at least generally successful five years after the thirty years peace he was called upon to display his generalship athens was involved in a war with one of the strongest members of her confederacy the island of samos the occasion of this war was a dispute which samos had with another member miletus about the possession of priena it appears that athens some years before had settled the constitution of miletus and placed a garrison in the city and yet we now find miletus engaged in a struggle with a non-tributary ally and when she is worsted appealing to athens the case shows how little we know of the various orderings of the relations between athens and her allies and subjects one would have thought the decision of such a case would have rested with athens from the first on the appeal she decided in favor of miletus and pericles sailed with forty-four triremes to samos where he overthrew the aristocracy carried away a number of hostages and established a democratic constitution leaving a garrison to protect it the nobles who fled to the mainland returned one night captured the garrison and handed them over to the persian satrap of sardis with whom they were intriguing they also recovered the hostages who had been lodged in the island of lemnos athens received another blow at the same time by the revolt of byzantium pericles sailed speedily back to samos and invested it with a large fleet hearing that a phoenician squadron was coming to assist the samians he raised the siege and with a part of his armament went to meet it during his absence the samians gained some successes against the athenian ships which were anchored close to the harbor at the end of two weeks pericles returned either the phoenicians had not appeared after all or they had been induced to sail home well nigh two hundred warships now blockaded samos and at the end of nine months the city surrendered the samians undertook to pull down their walls to surrender their ships and pay a war indemnity which amounted to fifteen hundred talents or thereabout they became subject to athens and were obliged to furnish soldiers to her armies but they were not made tributary the athenian citizens who fell in the war received a public burial at athens pericles pronounced the funeral oration and it may have been on this occasion that he used a famous phrase of the young men who had fallen the spring he said was taken out of the year byzantium also came back to the confederacy it had been a trying moment for athens for she had some reason to fear peloponnesian intervention sparta and her allies had met to consider the situation and the corinthians afterwards claimed whether truly or not that they deprecated any interference on the general principle that every state should be left to deal with her own rebellious allies however the corinthians may have acted on this occasion it was chiefly the commercial jealousy existing between athens and corinth that brought on the ultimate outbreak of hostilities between the athenians and peloponnesians which led to the destruction of the athenian empire it seems that during the excitement of the Samian War, Pericles deemed it expedient to place some restraints upon the license of the comic drama. What he feared was the effect which the free criticisms of the comic poets on his policy might have, not upon the Athenians themselves, but upon the strangers who were present in the theatre, and especially upon citizens of the subject states. The precaution shows that the situation was critical, though the restraints were withdrawn as soon as possible for they were contrary to the spirit of the time henceforward the only check on the comic poet was that he might be prosecuted before the council of five hundred for doing wrong to the people if his jests against the officers of the people went too far 
Comedy had grown up in Athens out of the mummeries of masked revellers who kept the feasts of Dionysus by singing phallic songs and flinging coarse jests at the folk. It was not till after the Persian War that the state recognized it. Then a place was given at the great festival of Dionysus to comic competitions. To the three days which were devoted to the competitions of tragedies, a fourth was added for the new contest. The comic drama then assumed form and shape. Magnes and Chionides were its first masters, but they were eclipsed by Cratinus, the most brilliant comic poet of the age of Pericles. There is no more significant symptom of the political and social health of the Athenian state in the period of its empire than the perfect freedom which was accorded to the comic stage, to laugh at everything in earth and heaven, and splash with ridicule every institution of the city and every movement of the day, to libel the statesmen and even jest at the gods. Such license is never permitted in an age of decadence, even under the shelter of religious usage. It can only prevail in a free country where men's belief in their own strength and virtue, in the excellence of their institutions and their ideals, is still true, deep, and fervent. Then they can afford to laugh at themselves. The old comedy is a most telling witness to the greatness of Athens. Section 11. Higher Education. The Sophists. Since the days of Nestor and Odysseus, the art of persuasive speech was held in honor by the Greeks. With the rise of the democratic commonwealths it became more important, and the greater attention which was paid to the cultivation of oratory may perhaps be reflected in the introduction of a new class of proper names, which refer to excellence in addressing public assemblies. The institutions of a Greek democratic city presupposed in the average citizen the faculty of speaking in public and for any one who was ambitious for a political career it was indispensable if a man was hauled into a law court by his enemies and knew not how to speak he was like an unarmed civilian attacked by soldiers in panoply the power of clearly expressing ideas in such a way as to persuade an audience was an art to be learned and taught but it was not enough to gain command of a vocabulary it was necessary to learn how to argue and to exercise oneself in the discussion of political and ethical questions. There was a demand for higher education. This tendency of democracy corresponded to the growth of that spirit of inquiry which had first revealed itself in Ionia in the field of natural philosophy. The study of nature had passed into a higher stage in the hands of two men of genius, whose speculations have had an abiding effect on science. Empedocles distinguished the four elements, and explained the development of the universe by the forces of attraction and repulsion which have held their place till today in scientific theory. This tendency of democracy corresponded to the growth of that spirit of inquiry which had first revealed itself in Ionia in the field of natural philosophy. The study of nature had passed into a higher stage in the hands of two men of genius, whose speculations have had an abiding effect on science. Empedocles distinguished the four elements, and explained the development of the universe by the forces of attraction and repulsion, which have held their place till today in scientific theory. He also foreshadowed the doctrine of the survival of the fittest. Democritus of Abdera, a man of vast learning, originated the atomic theory, which was in later days popularized by Epicurus, and in still later by the Roman Lucretius. The scientific imagination of Democritus generated the world from atoms, like in quality but different in size and weight, existing in void space. Such advances in the explanation of nature implied and promoted a new conception of what may be called methodized knowledge, and this conception was applied to every subject. The second half of the fifth century was an age of technical treatises. Oratory and cookery were alike reduced to systems political institutions and received morality became the subject of scientific inquiry. Desire of knowledge had led the Greeks to seek more information about foreign lands and peoples. They had begun both to know more of the world and to regard it with a more critical mind. Enlightenment was spreading. Prejudices were being dispelled. Herodotus, who was far from being a skeptic, fully appreciates the instructiveness of the story which he tells how Darius asked some Greeks for what price they would be willing to eat the dead bodies of their fathers. When they cry that nothing would induce them to do so, 
the king calls a tribe of Indians who eat their parents, and asks them what price they would accept to burn the bodies of their fathers. The Indians exclaim against the bare thought of such a horror. Custom, Pindar had said, and Herodotus echoes, is king of the world, and men began to distinguish between custom and nature. They felt that their own conventions and institutions required justification. The authority of usage and antiquity was not enough, and they compared human society with nature. The appeal to nature led indeed to very opposite theories. In the sight of nature, it was said, all are equal. Birth and wealth are indifferent. Therefore, the state should be built on the basis of perfect equality. On the other hand, it was argued that in the state of nature, the strong man subdues the weaker and rules over them. Therefore, monarchy is the natural constitution. But it matters little what particular inferences were drawn, for no attempt was made to put them into practice. The main point is that the questioning spirit was active. There were clever men everywhere, who refused to take anything on authority, who asked always, How do you know? and claimed to discuss all things in heaven and earth. It was in this atmosphere of critical inquiry and scepticism that Greece had to provide for the higher education of her youth, which the practical conditions of the democracy demanded. The demand was met by teachers who travelled about and gave general instruction in the art of speaking and in the art of reasoning, and out of their encyclopedic knowledge lectured on all possible subjects. They received fees for their courses, and were called sophists, of which name perhaps our best equivalent is professors. Properly, a sophist means one who was eminently proficient in some particular art, in poetry, for instance, or cookery. As applied to the teachers who educated the youths who were able to pay, the name acquired a slightly unfavorable color, partly owing to the distrust felt by the masses towards men who know too much, partly to the prejudice which in Greece always existed more or less against those who gave their services for pay partly, too, to the jealousy of those who were too poor to pay the fees, and were consequently at a great disadvantage in public life compared with men whom a sophist had trained. But this haze of contempt which hung about the sophistic profession did not imply the idea that the professors were impostors, who deliberately sought to hoodwink the public by arguments in which they did not believe themselves. That suggestion, which has determined the modern meaning of sophist and sophistry, was first made by the philosopher Plato, and is entirely unhistorical. The sophists did not confine themselves to teaching. They wrote much. They discussed occasional topics, criticized political affairs, diffused ideas. And it has been said that this part of their activity supplied in some measure the place of modern journalism. But the greatest of the professors were much more than either teachers or journalists. They not only diffused but set afloat ideas. They enriched the world with contributions to knowledge. They were all alike rationalists, spreaders of enlightenment, but they were very various in their views and doctrines. Gorgias of Leontini, Protagoras of Abdera, Prodicus of Seos, Hippias of Elis, Socrates of Athens, each had his own strongly marked individuality. To Socrates, who has a place apart from the others, we shall revert in a later chapter. Prodicus of Seos was a pessimist, and it was doubtless he whom the poet Euripides meant by the man who considered the ills of men to be more in number than their good things. It was Prodicus who invented the famous fable of Heracles at the crossway, choosing between virtue and pleasure. Of all the sophists, Protagoras was perhaps the greatest. He first distinguished the parts of speech, and founded the science of grammar for Europe. His activity as a teacher was chiefly at Athens, where he seems to have been intimate with Pericles. The story that Pericles and Protagoras spent a whole day arguing on the theory of punishment, a question which is still unsettled, illustrates the services which the sophists rendered to speculation. The retributive theory of justice, which logically enough led to the trial and punishment of animals and inanimate things, was called into question. And a counter-theory started that the object of punishment was to deter. Protagoras was a victim of the religious prejudices of the Athenians. He wrote a theological book, which he published by reading it aloud before a chosen audience in the house of his friend Euripides. The thesis of the work is probably contained in the first sentence. In regard to the gods, I cannot know that they exist, nor yet that they do not exist, for many things hinder such knowledge, the obscurity of the matter, and the shortness of human life. 
Protagoras may have himself believed in the gods. What he asserted was that their existence could not be a matter of knowledge. Unluckily, the book itself has perished. For a certain Pythodorus came forward as the standard-bearer of the state religion, and accused Protagoras of impiety. The philosopher deemed it wise to flee from Athens. He sailed for Sicily, and was lost at sea. When Euripides makes the choir of Thracian women in his play of Palamedes cry bitterly, Ye have slain, O Greeks, ye have slain the nightingale of the muses, the wizard bird that did no wrong. The poet was thinking of the dead friend who had come from the Thracian city. The sale of the book of Protagoras was forbidden in Athens, and all copies that could be found were publicly burned. The case of Protagoras was not the only case of the kind. Years before, the philosopher Anaxagoras had been condemned for impiety. Years after, Socrates would be condemned. These cases show that the Athenians were not more enlightened than other peoples, or less prejudiced. The attitude of Protagoras to theology was perfectly compatible with a fervent devotion to the religion of the state, but an Athenian jury was not sufficiently well educated to discern this. When we admire the spread of knowledge and reasoning in the fifth century, we must remember that the mass of citizens was not reached by the new light. They were still sunk in ignorance, suspicious and jealous of the training which could be got only by sons of the comparatively well-to-do, or those who were exceptionally intellectual. Gorgias was a philosophical thinker and politician, but he won his renown as an orator and a stylist. He taught Greece how to write a new kind of prose, not the cold style which appeals only to the understanding, but a brilliant style, rhythmic, flowery in diction, full of figures, speaking to the sense and imagination. In the inscription of a statue which his grandnephew erected to him at Olympia, it is said, no mortal ever invented a fairer art to temper the soul for manlihood and virtue. Wherever he went he was received with enthusiasm. We shall presently meet him as an ambassador at Athens. The sophists were the chief, the professional expounders of the intellectual movement. But the exaltation of reason had a no less powerful supporter in the poet Euripides. He used the tragic stage to disseminate rationalism. He undermined the popular religion from the very steps of the altar. By the necessity of the case he accomplished his work indirectly, but with consummate dexterity. Aeschylus and Sophocles had reverently modified religious legend, adapting it to their own ideals, interpreting it so as to satisfy their own moral standard. Euripides takes the myths just as he finds them, and contrives his dramas so as to bring the absurdities into relief. He does not acquiesce, like the older tragic poets, in the ways of the gods with men. He is not content to be a resigned pessimist. He will receive nothing on authority. He declines to bow to the orthodox opinions of his respectable fellow countrymen, on such matters as the institution of slavery or the position of women in society. He refuses to endorse the inveterate prejudice which prevailed even at Athens in favor of noble birth but perhaps nothing is so significant as his attitude to the contempt which the Greeks universally felt for other races than their own. Nowhere is Euripides more sarcastic than when, in his Medea, he makes Jason pose as a benefactor of the woman whom he has basely betrayed, on the ground that he has brought her out of an obscure barbarian home, and enabled her to enjoy the privilege of living in Greece. Yet we need not go to the most daring thinkers, to Euripides and the Sophists, to discern the spirit of criticism at work. The Periclean age has left us few more significant, and certainly no more beautiful, monuments than a tragic drama which won the first prize at the great Dionysia a few years after the Thirty Years' Peace. The soul of Sophocles was in untroubled harmony with the received religion, but, living in an atmosphere of criticism and speculation, even he could not keep his mind aloof from the questions which were debated by the thoughtful men of his time. He took as the motive of his Antigone a deep and difficult question of political and of ethical science, the relation of the individual citizen to the state. What shall a man do if his duty of obedience to the government of his country conflicts with other duties? Are there any obligations higher than that of loyalty to the laws of his city? The poet answers that there are such, for instance, certain obligations of religion. He justifies Antigone in her disobedience to the king's decree. The motive lends itself to dramatic treatment, and never has it been handled with such consummate art as by him who first saw its possibilities. 
but it is worth observing that the Antigone, besides its importance in the history of dramatic poetry, has a high significance in the development of European thought, as the first presentation of a problem which both touches the very roots of ethical theory and is, in daily practice, constantly clamoring for solution. End of chapter 9, part 11 Recording by Kalinda in Raymond, New Hampshire, on February twentieth, two 2008Part 36, being Chapter 10, Parts 1 and 2 of A History of Greece to the Death of Alexander the Great, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A History of Greece to the Death of Alexander the Great, Volume 1, by John Bagnall Bury, Chapter 10, Part 1. The War of Athens with the Peloponnesians, 431 to 421 BC. The empire and commercial supremacy of Athens had, as we have seen, swiftly drawn a war upon herself and Greece. That war had been indecisive. It had taught her some lessons, but it had not cooled her ambition or crippled her trade, and it was therefore inevitable that she should have to fight again. We have now to follow the second phase of the struggle, up to the culmination of that antagonism between Dorian and Ionian, of which the Greeks of this period never lost sight. Part 1. The Prelude of the War the incidents which led up to the Peloponnesian War are connected with two Corinthian colonies, Corcyra and Potidaea. Corcyra, which had always been an unfilial daughter, Potidaea, which, though maintaining friendly relations with Corinth, had become a member of the Athenian Confederacy. One of those party struggles in an insignificant city, which in Greece were often the occasion of wars between great states, had taken place in Epidamnus, a colony of Corcyra. The people, harassed by the banished nobles and their barbarian allies, asked help from their mother city. Corcyra refused, and Epidamnus turned to Corinth. The Corinthians sent troops and a number of new colonists. The Corcyrians, highly resenting this interference, demanded their dismissal, and when the demand was refused, blockaded the Isthmus of Epidamnus. Corinth then made preparations for an expedition against Corcyra, and Corcyra, in alarm, sent envoys to Corinth, proposing to refer the matter for arbitration to such Peloponnesian states as both should agree upon. But the Corinthians refused the arbitration, and sent a squadron of seventy-five ships with two thousand hoplites against the Corcyrians. The powerful navy of Corcyra consisted of a hundred and twenty ships, of which forty were besieging Epidamnus. With the remaining eighty ships they won a complete victory over the Corinthians outside the Ambracian Gulf, and on the same day Epidamnus surrendered. During the rest of the year, Corcyra had command of the Ionian Sea, and her triremes sailed about, damaging the allies of Corinth. But Corinth began to prepare for a greater effort against her powerful and detested colony. The work of preparation went on for two years. The report of the ships she was building, and the navies she was hiring, frightened Corcyra. For, while Corinth had the Peloponnesian League at her back, Corcyra had no allies, and belonged neither to the Athenian nor to the Spartan League. It was her obvious policy to seek a connection with Athens, and she determined to do so. The Corinthians, hearing of this intention, tried to thwart it, for they had good reason to fear a combination of the Athenian with the Corcyrian navy. And so it came to pass that the envoys of Corcyra and Corinth appeared together before the assembly of Athens. The arguments which Thucydides has put into their mouths express clearly the bearings of the situation and the importance of the decision for Athens. 
The main argument for accepting the proffered alliance of Corcyra depends on the assumption that war is imminent. The Lacedaemonians, fearing the growth of your empire, are eager to take up arms, and the Corinthians, who are your enemies, are all powerful with them. They begin with us, but they will go on to you, that we may not stand united against them in the bond of a common enmity. And it is our business to strike first, and to forestall their designs instead of waiting to counteract them. On this assumption, the alliance of Corcyra offers great advantages. It lies conveniently on the route to Sicily, and it possesses one of the only three considerable navies in Greece. If the Corinthians get hold of our fleet, and you allow the two to become one, you will have to fight against the united navies of Corcyra and the Peloponnesus. But if you make us your allies, you will have our navy in addition to your own, ranged at your side in the impending conflict. The reply of the Corinthian ambassadors was weak. Their appeal to certain past services that Corinth had rendered to Athens could hardly have much effect, for there was nothing but jealousy between the two cities. They might deprecate, but they could not disprove, the notion that Athens would soon have a war with the Peloponnesus on her hands. And as for justice, Corcyra could make as plausible a case as Corinth. The most cogent argument for Corinth was that if Athens allied herself with Corcyra, she would take a step which, if not in itself violating the Thirty Years' Peace, would necessarily involve a violation of it. After two debates, the assembly agreed to an alliance with Corcyra, but of a defensive kind. Athens was only to give armed help in case Corcyra itself were threatened. By this decision, she avoided a direct violation of the treaty. Ten ships were sent to Corcyra, with orders not to fight unless Corcyra or some of the places belonging to it were attacked. A great and tumultuous naval engagement ensued near the islet of Sibota, between Leukimi, the southeastern promontory of Corcyra, and the Thesprotian mainland. A Corcyrian fleet of a hundred and ten ships was ranged against a Corinthian of a hundred and fifty, the outcome of two years of preparation. The right wing of the Corcyrians was worsted, and the ten Athenian ships, which had held aloof at first, interfered to prevent its total discomfiture. In the evening the sudden sight of twenty new Athenian ships on the horizon caused the Corinthians to retreat, and the next day they declined battle. This seemed an admission of defeat, and justified the Corcyrians in raising a trophy. But the Corinthians also raised a trophy, for they had come off best in the battle. They returned home then, and on their way captured Anactorian, which Corcyra and Corinth held in common. Corinth treated the Corcyrians, who had been taken captive in the battle, with great consideration. Most of them were men of importance, and it was hoped that through them Corcyra might ultimately be won over to friendship with Corinth. It will be seen afterwards that the hope was not ill-founded. The breach with Corinth forced Athens to look to the security of her interests in the Colchidic Peninsula, where Corinth had a great deal of influence. The city of Potidaea, which occupies and guards the Isthmus of Palini, was a tributary ally of Athens, but received its annual magistrates from its mother city, Corinth. Immediately after the Battle of Sibota, Athens required the Potidaeans to raise the city walls on the south side, where they were not needed for protection against Macedonia, and to abandon the system of Corinthian magistrates. The Potidaeans refused. They were supported by the promise of Sparta to invade Attica in case Potidaea were attacked by Athens. But the situation was complicated by the policy of the Macedonian king Perdiccas, who had been formerly the friend of Athens, but was now her adversary, because she had befriended his brothers, who were now leagued against him. He conceived and organized a general revolt of Chalcidice against Athens, and even persuaded the Chalcidians to pull down their cities on the coast and concentrate themselves in the strong inland town of Olynthus. The Botiaeans also, centered on Spartulus, joined the rebels. Thus the revolt of Potidaea, while it has its special causes in connection with the enmity of Athens and Corinth, under another aspect forms part of a general movement in that quarter 
against the Athenian dominion. The Athenians began operations in Macedonia, but soon advanced against Potidaea and gained an advantage over the Corinthian general Aristeus, who had arrived with some Peloponnesian forces. This battle has a particular interest, for a graven stone still speaks to us of the sorrow of Athens for the men who fell fighting foremost before Potidaea's walls, and, giving their lives in barter for glory, ennobled their country. The Athenians then invested the city. So far the Corinthians had acted alone. Now, seeing the danger of Potidaea, they took active steps to incite the Lacedaemonians to declare war against Athens. Pericles knew that war was coming, and he promptly struck, not with sword or spear, but with a more cruel and deadly weapon. Megara had assisted Corinth at the Battle of Sabota. The Athenians passed a measure excluding the Megarians from the markets and ports of their empire. The decree spelt economical ruin to Megara, and Megara was an important member of the Peloponnesian League. The Athenian statesmen knew how to strike. The comic poet sang how The Olympian Pericles in wrath Full mend o'er Greece and set her in a broil With statutes worded like a drinking catch No Megarian on land nor in market shall stand Nor sail in the sea nor set foot on the strand The allies appeared at Sparta And brought formal charges against Athens Of having broken the thirty years' peace And committed various acts of injustice some Athenian envoys, who were at Sparta, ostensibly for other business, were given an opportunity of replying. But arguments and recriminations were superfluous. It did not matter in the least whether Athens could defend this transaction, or Corinth could make good that charge. For, in the case of an inevitable war, the causes openly alleged seldom correspond with the motives which really govern. It was not the Corcyrian incidents, or the siege of Potidaea, or the Megarian decree that caused the Peloponnesian war, though jointly they hastened its outbreak. It was the fear and jealousy of the Athenian power. The only question was whether it was the right hour to engage in that unavoidable struggle. The Spartan king, Archidamus, advised delay. Do not take up arms yet. War is not an affair of arms, but of money which gives to arms their use, and which is needed above all things when a continental is fighting against a maritime power. Let us find money first, and then we may safely allow our minds to be excited by the speeches of our allies. But the efforts were in favour of war. Sthenelidas, in a short and pointed speech, put the question, not, shall we declare war, but, has the treaty been broken, and are the Athenians in the wrong? It was decided that the Athenians were in the wrong, and this decision necessarily led to a declaration of war. But before that declaration was made, the approval of the Delphic Oracle was gained, and a general assembly of the Allies gathered at Sparta and agreed to the war. Thucydides chose the setting well for his brilliant contrast between the characters and spirits and aims of the two great protagonists who now prepare to stand face to face on the stage of Hellenic history. He makes the Corinthian envoys, at the first assembly in Sparta, the spokesman of his comparison. You have never considered, O Lacedaemonians, what manner of men are these Athenians with whom you will have to fight, and how utterly unlike yourselves. They are revolutionary, equally quick in the conception and in the execution of every new plan, while you are conservative, careful only to keep what you have, originating nothing, and not acting even when action is most necessary. They are bold beyond their strength, they run risks which prudence would condemn, and in the midst of misfortune they are full of hope. Whereas it is your nature, though strong, to act feebly, when your plans are most prudent, to distrust them, and when calamities come upon you, to think that you will never be delivered from them. They are impetuous, and you are dilatory. They are always abroad, and you are always at home. For they hope to gain something by leaving their homes, but you are afraid that any new enterprise may imperil what you have already." When conquerors, they pursue their victory to the utmost. When defeated, they fall back the least. Their bodies they devote to the country, as though they belong to other men. 
Their true self is their mind, which is most truly their own when employed in her service. When they do not carry out an intention which they have formed, they seem to have sustained a personal bereavement. When an enterprise succeeds, they have gained a mere instalment of what is to come. But if they fail, they at once conceive new hopes, and so fill up the void. With them alone, to hope is to have, for they lose not a moment in the execution of an idea. This is the lifelong task, full of danger and toil, which they are always imposing upon themselves. None enjoy their good things less, because they are always seeking for more. To do their duty is their only holiday, and they deem the quiet of inaction to be as disagreeable as the most tiresome business. If a man should say of them, in a word, that they were born neither to have peace themselves, nor to allow peace to other men, he would simply speak the truth. On the present occasion, however, the Athenians did not give an example of that promptness in action which is contrasted in this passage with the dilatory habits of the Spartans. We shall presently see why. It was the object of Sparta to gain time. Accordingly, she sent embassies to Athens with trivial demands. She required the Athenians to drive out the curse of the goddess, which rested on the family of the Alcmeonidae. This was a raking up of history two centuries old, the period of Chilon's conspiracy. The point of it lay in the fact that Pericles, on his mother's side, belonged to the accursed family. Athens replied by equally trivial demands. The purification of the curse of Athena of the brazen house, and of the curse of Tinarus, where some helots had been murdered in the temple of Poseidon. These amenities, which served the purpose of Sparta by gaining time, were followed by an ultimatum, in the sense that Athens might still have peace if she restored the independence of the Hellenes. There was a peace party at Athens, but Pericles carried the day. Let us send the ambassadors away, he said, giving them this answer, that we will not exclude the Megarians from our markets and harbours, if the Lacedaemonians will not exclude foreigners, whether ourselves or our allies, from Sparta, for the treaty no more forbids the one than the other. That we will concede independence to the cities, if they were independent when we made the treaty, and as soon as the Lacedaemonians allow their subject states to be governed as they choose, not for the interest of Lacedaemon, but for their own. Also, that we are willing to offer arbitration according to the treaty, and that we do not want to begin the war, but intend to defend ourselves if attacked. This answer will be just, and befits the dignity of the city. We must be aware, however, that the war will come, and the more willing we are to accept the situation, the less ready will our enemies be to lay hands upon us. Pericles was in no haste to draw the sword. He had delivered a blow already by the Megarian decree. The peoples of Greece were parted as follows on the sides of the two chief antagonists. Sparta commanded the whole Peloponnesus, except her old enemy Argos and Achaea. She commanded the Isthmus, for she had both Corinth and Megara. In northern Greece she had Boeotia, Phocis, and Locris. In western Greece, Ambracia, Anactorion, and the island of Lucas. In western Greece, Athens commanded the Acarnanians, Corcyra, and Zacynthus, as well as the Messenians of Naupactus. In northern Greece, she had Plataea, and these were her only allies beyond her confederacy. Athens' strength lay in her fleet, large and well trained. In addition to the ships of Lesbos and Chios, and the possible help from Corcyra, she had three hundred triremes of her own. Her fleet had a long tradition of active fighting, and had maintained annual patrols in the Aegean, even in peace. The nucleus of her crews was Athenian, but the numbers needed were too large to be supplied from the citizen body alone, and a considerable proportion of her rowers were recruited in the islands, where men who had few chances to earn a livelihood at home were glad to earn good pay in a service with great traditions. On the Peloponnesian side, the Corinthians alone were a naval power, and their failure at Sibota had emphasised their weakness. They had little experience of fighting, and their ships and crews were outclassed. On land, however, the Peloponnesians had an immense advantage. 
with their Boeotian allies, they could put into the field at least 30,000 men without using reserves, and the Lacedaemonians were still the best hoplites in Greece. Against them, the Athenians had a field force of 13,000 hoplites, with 1,200 cavalry, including mounted archers, and a reserve force, including metics, of 16,000. Scarcely less important to Athens than her armed forces were her financial reserves. More than 1,200 talents had been spent on crushing the revolt of Samos, and it was clear that war with the Peloponnesians would involve heavier and more expensive commitments. Pericles well knew that the efficiency of a navy depended in large part on regular and high pay, and that war could not be financed on emergency measures. He had therefore deliberately aimed at maintaining a reserve for the inevitable clash. As war drew near, special measures were taken to restrict expenditure. The building program on the Acropolis was halted. Further expenditure beyond a low annual limit from the reserve was made subject to a special vote of sanction in the assembly. The treasures in money and kind of the other gods in the city below the Acropolis and throughout Attica were concentrated on the Acropolis, where they would be safe from invading Peloponnesians and readily available if the state needed to use them. After the peace of Callias, the principle had been established that the tribute could be used for Athenian purposes, and it was the accumulation of tribute that formed the bulk of the reserve. It had been given to the safekeeping of Athena, and is described in documents as the sacred monies of Athena. Spending from this reserve for war purposes involved loans from the goddess. A strict record had to be kept, and the interest on the debts was carefully calculated. In this reserve, when the war broke out, there were some 6,000 talents, and Athens could expect an annual income from home sources and the empire of some 1,000 talents. From the experience of the Samian revolt, Athens, in 431, seemed likely to be able to finance war without resorting to extreme measures. The Peloponnesians were in a much weaker position. They had no financial reserves and no common war chest. Their organization was well adapted to land operations, but they lacked the essential financial basis for naval warfare. The Corinthians could talk lightly of attracting the allies from the Athenian crews by higher pay, but in their hearts they knew that these were empty words. Not until Persian subsidies were secured could the Peloponnesians keep large fleets for long periods at sea. Part 2. General View of the War. Thucydides. The war on which we are now entering is a resumption, on a somewhat greater scale, of the war which was concluded by the Thirty Years' Peace. Here, too, the Corinthians are the most active instigators of the opposition to Athens. The Spartans are but half-hearted leaders, and have to be spurred by their allies. The war lasts ten years, and is concluded by the Peace of Nicias. But hostilities begin again, and pass for a time to a new scene of warfare, the island of Sicily. This war ends with the Battle of Igospotomy, which decided the fate of the Athenian Empire. Thus, during fifty-five years, Athens was contending for her empire with the Peloponnesians, and this conflict falls into three distinct wars. The first ending with the Thirty Years' Peace, the second with the Peace of Nicias, the third with the Battle of Igospotomy. But while there is a break of thirteen years between the First War and the Second, there is hardly any break between the Second War and the Third. Hence the second and the third, which have been united in the history of Thucydides, are generally grouped closely together and called by the common name of the Peloponnesian War. This name is never used by Thucydides, but it shows how Athenian the sympathies of historians have always been. From the Peloponnesian point of view, the conflict would be called the Attic War. It will not be amiss to repeat here what the true cause of the struggle was. Athens was resolved to maintain, in spite of Greece, her naval empire, and thus far she was responsible. But there is no reason to suppose that she had any design of seriously increasing her empire, and the idea of some modern historians that Pericles undertook the war in the hope of winning supremacy over all Hellas is contrary to the plain facts of the case. 
This war has attained a celebrity in the world's history, which, considering its scale and its consequences, may seem unmerited. A domestic war between small Greek states may be thought a slight matter indeed, compared with the struggle in which Greece was arrayed against the might of Persia. But the Peloponnesian War has had an advantage which has been granted to no other episode in the history of Hellas. It has been recorded by the first and the greatest of Greek critical historians. To read the book which Thucydides, the son of Olorus, has bequeathed to posterity, is in itself a liberal education, a lesson in politics and history, which is, as he aimed to make it, a possession for ever. Only a few years can have separated the day on which Herodotus completed his work, and the day on which Thucydides began his. But from the one to the other there is a sheer leap. When political events have passed through the brain of Herodotus, they come out as delightful stories. With the insatiable curiosity of an inquirer, he has little political insight. He has the instinct of a literary artist. His historical methods are rudimentary. The splendid work of Herodotus has more in common with the epic poets who went before him than with the historians who came after him. When he began to collect material for his history, the events of the Persian invasion were already encircled with a halo of legend, so that he had a subject thoroughly to his taste. It is a strange sensation to turn from the naive, uncritical, entrancing storyteller of Halicarnassus to the grave historian of Athens. The first history, in the true sense of the word, sprang full-grown into life, like Athena from the brain of Zeus and it is still without a rival. Severe in its reserves, written from a purely intellectual point of view, unencumbered with platitudes and moral judgments, cold and critical, but exhibiting the rarest powers of dramatic and narrative art, the work of Thucydides is at every point a contrast to the work of Herodotus. Mankind might well despair if the science of criticism had not advanced further since the days of Thucydides, and we are not surprised to find that when he deals, on the threshold of his work, with the earlier history of Greece, he fails to carry his sceptical treatment far enough, and accepts some traditions which on his own principles he should have questioned. But the interval which divides Thucydides from his elder contemporary Herodotus is a whole heaven, The interval which divides Thucydides from a critic of our own day is small indeed. Reserved as he is, Thucydides cannot disguise that he was a democrat of the Periclean school. He makes no secret of his admiration for the political wisdom of Pericles. It must be granted that the incidents of the war would lose something of their interest, that the whole episode would be shorn of much of its dignity and eminence, if Thucydides had not deigned to be its historian. But it was not a slight or unworthy theme. It is the story of the decline and fall of the Athenian Empire, and at this period Athens is the centre of ecumenical history. The importance of the war is not impaired by the smallness of the states which were involved in it. For in these small states lived those political ideas and institutions which concerned the future development of mankind far more than any movements in the barbarous kingdoms, however great their territory. The war of ten years which now began may seem at first sight to have consisted of a number of disconnected and haphazard incidents, but both the Athenians and the Peloponnesians had definite objects in view. Their plans were determined by the nature of their own resources and by the geography of the enemy's territories. The key to the war is the fundamental fact that it was waged between a power which was mainly continental and a power which was mainly maritime. From the nature of the case, the land power is obliged to direct its attacks chiefly on the continental possessions of the sea power, while the sea power has to confine itself to attacking the maritime possessions of the land power. It follows that the small land army of the sea power and the small fleet of the land power are each mainly occupied with the work of defence, and are seldom free to act on the offensive. Hence the maritime possessions of the maritime power and the inland possessions of the continental power, are not generally the scene of warfare. These considerations simplify the war. 
the points at which the Peloponnesians can attack Athens with their land forces are Attica itself and Thrace. Accordingly, Attica is invaded almost every year, and there is constant warfare in Thrace. But the war is hardly ever carried into the Aegean or to the Asiatic coast, except in consequence of some special circumstance, such as the revolt of an Athenian ally. On the other hand, the offensive operations of Athens are mainly in the west of Greece, about the islands of the Ionian Sea and near the mouth of the Corinthian Gulf. That was the region where they had the best prospect, by their naval superiority, of detaching members from the Peloponnesian alliance. Thrace, Attica, and the seas of western Greece are therefore the chief and constant scenes of the war. There are episodes elsewhere, but they are to some extent accidental. Pericles had completely abandoned the policy of continental enterprise which had led up to the Thirty Years' Peace. That enterprise had been a departure from the policy, initiated by Themistocles, of concentrating all the energy of Athens on the development of her naval power. Pericles returned to this policy without reserve, and he appears at the outbreak of the war under the inspiration of the Salaminian spirit. Athens is now to show the same extreme independence of her land, the same utter confidence in her ships, which she had shown when the Mede approached her borders. Let us give up lands and houses, said Pericles, but keep a watch over the city and the sea. We should not, under any irritation at the loss of our property, give battle to the Peloponnesians, who far outnumber us. More not for houses or lands, but for men. Men may give these but these will not give men. If I thought that you would listen to me, I would say to you, go yourselves and destroy them, and thereby prove to the Peloponnesians that none of these things will move you, for such is the power which the empire of the sea gives. This was the spirit in which Pericles undertook the war. The policy of sacrificing Attica was no rash or perverse audacity. It was only part of a well-considered system of strategy, for which Pericles has been severely blamed. His object was to wear out the enemy, not to attempt to subjugate or decisively defeat. He was determined not to court a great battle, for which the land forces of Athens were manifestly insufficient. On land Boeotia alone was a match for her. He adopted the strategy of exhaustion, as it has been called, the strategy which consists largely in manoeuvring and considers the economy of one's own forces as solicitously as the damaging of the foe, which will accept battle only under certain conditions, which is always on the watch for favourable opportunities, but avoids great risks. The more we reflect on the conditions of the struggle and the nature of the Athenian resources, the more fully will the plan of Pericles approve itself as the strategy uniquely suitable to the circumstances. Nor will the criticism that he neglected the land defences of Attica, and the suggestion that he should have fortified the frontier against invasions, bear close examination. The whole Athenian land army would have been required to garrison both the Megarian and Boeotian frontiers, and there would have been no troops left for operations elsewhere nor would it have been easy for a citizen army to abide on duty, as would in this case have been necessary for a large part of the year. It was quite in accord with the spirit of the patient strategy of Pericles that he refrained from the temptation of striking a blow at the enemy when they had resolved on war, but were not yet prepared. One effective blow he had indeed struck, the decree against Megara. To damage the foe commercially was an essential part of his method. Within a few years this method would doubtless have been crowned with success, and brought about a peace favourable to Athens, but for untoward events which he could not foresee. End of chapter 10, part 2 This recording is in the public domain.